Okay, the video that you're about to see is five hours long and is that long because I'm gonna take you through every single question in a complete IELTS mock test. I'm gonna explain each question type to you. You'll have an opportunity to answer the question for yourself, then I'll explain the answers to you. Now, you can complete this mock test just by watching this video, which is fine. But if you'd like to simulate test day conditions, I highly recommend using this. This is a fillable test book that includes every single question in this video and an answer sheet to fill in as you go. This test book is free. All you need to do is download it by clicking the link in the description below this video. You can print it out like this if you want, or you can type your answers into the PDF on a computer, it's fillable. I'm gonna be referring to this as we go throughout the entire video. Good luck. If you've never taken the IELTS before, don't worry. This video simulates test day experience and I'll teach you everything you need to know so you're 100% ready. If you have taken the IELTS before, then this video is going to show you where you've been going wrong and how you can improve to get the scores you need. So you can take this test just by watching this video, that's fine, or as I mentioned, you can download the fillable test book and answer sheets. Before we get started with the listening test, let me explain what's coming up. So this is a full IELTS mock test. It's for academic and general training candidates. We're gonna do all four sections. It's gonna be the same level of difficulty as the actual IELTS test. We're gonna start with listening, then do reading, then writing task two, then you'll split into either academic writing task one or general writing task one, and we'll finish with speaking. We'll look at overviews, scoring and answer explanations as we go, and we'll finish up with an analysis of your scores and the next steps that you need to take. An analysis of your score at the end is critical because it'll show you if you're ready to take the IELTS or not, and if not, what you'll need to work on and how. So by watching this video, not only will you gain a full understanding of all parts of the IELTS and learn some amazing tips and strategies, you'll also know exactly what to do with your mock test scores when you get them at the end, okay? This will be fun, so you might wanna share this video with your friends on social media. All right, let's kick it off with IELTS listening. All right, let me give you a very quick overview of the listening section. So IELTS listening has four parts. There are 10 questions per part. So there are 40 questions in total. This test also gets progressively harder as you go. And of course, there are various question types. At the end of this listening test, you're going to have a score out of 40, okay? Then you can turn that raw score into an IELTS listening score. Let me show you how. So if you get a score of 33, for example, that's the equivalent of an IELTS 7.5 for listening. And we're gonna revisit these scores at the end so you know what your score is. As mentioned, there are four parts in IELTS listening. And in each part, there are two or three sets of questions. So we're gonna go through the test one set of questions at a time. I'll explain what you have to do for each set of questions, then you'll do them, and then I'll explain the answers. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry, I'm gonna take you through it all. Here we go, part one, questions one to three, form completion. So in front of you, you will see a form with gaps. You're going to have to listen very carefully and fill these gaps with one word and or a number. You can see the example question here. So you could write the word three or you could write the number three. Ready? Let's do it. Before the audio begins, I'm gonna give you some time to familiarize yourself with these questions. Hi, this is Vistaview Real Estate. You're speaking with Marie. How can I help you today? Hi, Marie. I'm looking for a house to rent for me and my family. 
Okay, well, you've come to the right place. We have quite a few available at the moment, including some new listings. But let's start with your name. My name's Andre Peterson. Okay, Andre. How many bedrooms are you looking for? Well, we'd need three. There are four of us in the family, my wife and I, and our two daughters. My daughters won't mind sharing a room. Okay. We have a number of properties that might be suitable. Whereabouts do you want to live? Well, we've had a look around at some suburbs on the outskirts of the city, but it would be great to be quite central. Both my wife and I work in the city, so it would be more convenient for both of us. Hmm, that could be difficult. Let me see. It looks like we only have a three-bedroom apartment in that area. Would that interest you? No, I don't think so. We need an outdoor area for our daughters, so an apartment won't suit us. Okay, then you'll need to be a little further out. Tell me, what's your budget for rent? Around $2,200 per month. Okay, so that's about uh, $550 per week? That's right, though I could push it to $580 a week, but no higher than that. Okay, we can find something quite nice for that amount. Rent prices have dropped recently, which is good. Oh, I'm glad. They were getting quite expensive. They sure were. So, how long are you hoping to rent the property for? I know that the typical lease is for two years, but I have a job contract for three years, so I would like a lease for the full duration of my contract, and I'm not interested in a single-year lease. I understand. I'm sure that will be fine. And how soon do you plan to move in? As soon as possible, really. November 10th would be ideal. My new job starts just a week later. Okay, how did you go with questions one to three? Let's go through the answers. Okay, so where are we looking? We're looking at preferred location because she says, whereabouts do you want to live? Which means the same thing. Then he says, it would be great to be quite central. So the answer to number one is in the central area of the city. You may have been distracted by two words here, outskirts or convenient. They would be incorrect. Question number two, we're looking at maximum weekly rent. She says, what is your budget for rent? He says $580 a week, but no higher than that. That's his maximum weekly rent. So the answer for number two is the number 580, 580. You may have been distracted by 2,200 per month, or when she said 550 per week, you need to be careful of distractors. Here we're looking at lease length preferred. The woman said, so how long are you hoping to rent the property for? In other words, she's talking about the lease, and then he actually says the word lease. Now, the answer is three years. He said, I have a job contract for three years, so I would like a lease for the full duration of my contract. Can you see that? Now, you may have been distracted by two years or single year. Both of these answers are wrong. Now, be very careful because the instruction said that we could write one word and or a number. So you cannot write two words. If you wrote three years with two words, this would be considered wrong, even though the information is actually correct. You need to write the number three and then the word years. So the answers are number one, central. Number two, 580 is a number. Number three, three years, a number and a word. Let's now fill in our answer sheet. If you're taking the paper-based IELTS test, remember that you'll have 10 minutes at the end of the entire listening test to fill in your answer sheet. But we're gonna fill in the answer sheet as we go so you know exactly what you have to write into those gaps. So here's what your answer sheet should look like. If you haven't downloaded the fillable test book and answer sheet just yet, please do it because we're going to use it not just for listening, but also for reading, writing and speaking. Okay, let's do questions four to eight. This is table completion. 
So this is pretty similar to note completion that we just did. Again, you'll need to fill the gaps with one word and or a number. Make sure you read that instruction very carefully on test day. Now you get some time before the audio begins to analyze this question. What you wanna do first is follow the numbers. So it's four, five, six, seven, eight. This will also be in the same order as the audio. So you wanna work through the table from left to right and top to bottom. You'll now have some time to familiarize yourself with this table before the audio begins. Let me tell you about what we've got. There's one at 47 Craig Street. It's a three bedroom that's been recently renovated. It has a single bathroom and they're asking $570 per week. Oh, I ideally we'd like two bathrooms. There are four of us. Fair enough. This one at 36 Cleveland is quite large. It actually has four bedrooms, a lovely lounge and dining, as well as two bathrooms. That sounds good. How much is it? It's within your budget. It also has a double garage and a large garden, too. Hmm. Off-street parking sounds good, but I don't like the sound of too much gardening work. We won't really have time to look after it. A small one would be good, though. We have an older house on the edge of town on Hill Street with three bedrooms and two bathrooms. It's a two-story and quite large. It has a small but lovely backyard, and it's not too far from the bus station. But I must admit that it's in a very hilly area. The driveway is particularly steep. Oh, that might not be too bad. How much is the rent for that one? Well... It's $480 per week, down from $500 per week. Hmm. Anything else? Well, the last option is a small two-bedroom house with a study. It has a lovely layout with an open lounge and dining room. The kitchen is a bit old, but it's quite functional, and the whole house has been recently painted. The garden is small. It's in Market Street, just off the main street. It's $520 per week. That sounds like a good option. Okay, how did you go with table completion? Let's go through the answers and hopefully you didn't get distracted. Okay, so we're looking at question number four and we're starting on Craig Street. We're looking at possible problems and the start of the question says only one something. We know that we need a noun here. And the problem with Craig Street is that it only has a single bathroom and the man says, ideally, we'd like two bathrooms. So the answer for number four is bathroom, one word. For question number five, we're talking about Cleveland Street. We're also looking at a possible problem or problems. For question number five, it says the something is too big. The woman says it has a double garage and a large garden. The man says, I don't like the sound of too much gardening work. We won't really have time to look after it. So the answer for number five is garden. Now, hopefully you weren't distracted by parking or the word gardening, which would be considered incorrect. Okay, we're now listening for Hill Street. And again, we're gonna to listen to a possible problem and also for question number seven, the weekly rent. So if we look at question six, it says the road to the house, the road to the house is to what? What's a road to the house? Well, that's a driveway. And the woman says the driveway is particularly steep. Hopefully you wrote the word steep and not the word hilly, which was a distractor. The area is hilly, the driveway is steep. Now the weekly rent, was $480, 480. There's already a dollar sign, so you don't need to write the dollar sign. And hopefully you weren't distracted by the number 500 because the rent has come down from 500 to 480. So the answer there is 480. 
For question number eight, we're listening for the name of the street. And towards the end of what the woman says, she says it's in Market Street, just off the Main Street. So Main Street there was a distractor. The answer is Market Street. Okay, so the possible answers there are Market with a capital M or Market with uppercase letters. So here's what your answer sheet should look like for questions four to eight. Now in IELTS listening, when you write your answer, I recommend that you write your answers all in uppercase letters. It's just much easier. Okay, let's do questions nine and 10. This is multiple choice. And if we look carefully at it, it says which two after school programs does Highfield Grammar offer? That means that you have to select two answer options. Before the audio begins, I'll give you a little bit of time to familiarize yourself with these answer options. Can you tell me about the primary schools in the area? My daughters are in years three and five. Yes, there are three schools within walking distance. There's Groveland Primary, Highfield Grammar, and Mayton State. Do these schools offer any after-school activities? My wife and I tend to work quite late on weekdays. Yes, they all do. Let me see. Ah, here it is. So, all of the schools offer a swimming program. Ah, Groveland Primary and Mayton State have an after-school chess club, if your daughters are into that. Oh, they do like chess. That could be good. Mayton State offers French language classes, as well as tennis and badminton while Highfield Grammar and Groveland Primary do not. They both teach after-school physics and chemistry classes, though, which could be fun. My daughters are good at math, but they're not really into science, I'm afraid. Do any of the schools offer painting or drawing by any chance? Doesn't look like it. They might next semester. So, should I show you some photos of the house? Okay, how did you go? Did you select two? Hopefully you did. Let's check the answers. So the answers here are D and E, science and swimming. So we're listening specifically for which after-school programs Highfield Grammar offers, not the other schools. So we're listening specifically for this school's after-school programs. Right at the start, the woman says all of the schools offer a swimming program. Hopefully you got that one. There were also some distractors here because she mentioned chess club, he mentioned chess, she mentioned French, but that was for Mayton State. She also mentioned tennis and badminton or racket sports, but again, this was not for high field grammar. Then she talks about the physics and chemistry classes, what can be thought of as science classes. It does say that Highfield Grammar offers science or physics and chemistry classes. So hopefully you got D. Then there were some more distractors because the man says math, as well as painting and drawing, which could be considered art. But the answers there are D and E. So on your answer sheet for questions nine and 10, you can write D and E, or you can write E and D. It doesn't matter which order you write these in. All right, fantastic. You've just done part one of IELTS listening. How did you go? Please let us know in the comments below and also click that subscribe button for great IELTS videos every single week. Let's now do part two. Okay, so part two, this is questions 11 to 16. And again, we're doing multiple choice. So questions 11 to 16, it says choose two letters, A to E. Before the audio begins, I'm going to give you some time to familiarize yourself with these questions. Hi everybody, welcome to Ace Gym. We're excited to officially open today and to welcome you as the first of our valued employees. I'm sure we'll all have lots of fun working together. My name is Janice. 
As you can see, Ace Gym is a brand new purpose-built facility. Mind you, because we're opening ahead of schedule, there's still a bit of building development going on, as you will see. Our squash courts are still under construction, so anyone wanting to play will have to use the tennis courts instead. And over the next few days, you'll have to instruct people to take the stairs, because our lift hasn't been properly installed yet. Also, keep in mind that the pool is off limits until we fix the water pump, which some people will find disappointing. But the sauna and steam rooms are still accessible. So there are still plenty of things for people to do. What else? Oh, most of our classes are starting today, which is exciting, and many of you will be involved in teaching them. We've got a healthy number of sign-ups already, and we're looking forward to seeing you all in action. Yoga and spin classes are starting in a few hours. Alex and Simon, I believe you'll be taking those classes. There have been quite a few inquiries about next week's boxing classes, Michael. I hope you're well prepared for those. And Paula, we have six people signed up for your dancing lesson this afternoon. And lastly, the active seniors classes with Michelle will begin later in the week too. They should be lots of fun. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, Bryce, our new marketing manager, has organised a series of promotional radio interviews. We've asked Jenna, our new general manager, to speak to 4KW next week about the various classes we have available, including our grit strength and body combat sessions. And David will be in the spotlight too to promote our weight loss programme before the end of the month. Next month, we'll be promoting our pregnancy classes, as well as our meditation and Pilates classes. We expect all of these classes to be very well subscribed to, as they're popular at nearby gyms. At the same time, we'll also do some advertising where we'll target new mothers about infant water safety and why these classes are so important. Cool, how did you go with these ones? Multiple choice can actually be pretty tricky. I mean, it's a straightforward question type, but you have to actually sort of read and listen at the same time. If you want practice, then check out our live classes on E2 Test Prep. Click the link in the description below. Okay, so questions 11 and 12. The answers are B, elevator, and E, swimming pool. Let me explain why. So we're listening for which two facilities are currently unavailable or not available at the gym. The speaker says, because we're opening ahead of schedule, there's still a bit of building development going on. Then she says our squash courts are still under construction or unavailable, but there's actually no squash courts in the answer options. There is, however, tennis courts, which is a distractor. Then she says, you'll have to instruct people to take the stairs because our lift hasn't been properly installed yet. In other words, it's unavailable. So lift and elevator are synonyms, so therefore the answer is B. Then she says, keep in mind the pool is off limits. Off limits is a synonym for unavailable or not available. So swimming pool E is also the correct answer. Then there was another two distractors. She says sauna and steam rooms are still accessible. So that's incorrect. So remember that on your answer sheet, you can write 11B, 12E, or you can write 11E, 12B. For questions 13 and 14, which two classes will run today? Be very careful with this. It's not tomorrow, it's not next week or next month. Which two classes are running today? Okay, so she says yoga and spin classes are starting in a few hours. So that's today. And we have for option D, yoga. So that's the correct answer there. Then there's a distractor. She says there have been quite a few inquiries about next week's boxing classes, Michael. So boxing is incorrect because it's not happening today. Then she says we have six people signed up for your dancing lesson this afternoon. That's today. So dancing and dance are synonymous or different word forms. So the answer there is E, dance. 
Then we have a distractor where she says, the active seniors classes with Michelle will begin later in the week too. So that's not today. So the answers are D and E here. For questions 15 and 16, we're listening for which two classes will be advertised next month. So she says, grit strength and body combat sessions. And then she says the weight loss program will be advertised at the end of the month. So not next month, at the end of this month. So they are actually incorrect, they're distractors. Then she says, next month, we'll be promoting our pregnancy classes, that's also a distractor, as well as our meditation and Pilates classes. So if we look in the list, we can see meditation classes. So that's correct, D, meditation. Now further along, she says at the same time, in other words, next month, we'll also do some advertising where we'll target new mothers about infant water safety. And that is in fact A. So the answers here are A and D. So this is what you would write on your answer sheet. Remember, the answers can come in any order. All right, how are you going so far? We're almost halfway through the listening test. Make sure you click that like button. Questions 17 to 20, map completion. So on test day, you might see a map that looks like this. This one's kind of interesting because it's showing the different floors of the gym. It actually has three floors or three different levels. So it's a little bit different to the types of maps that you usually see. What you have to do is listen very carefully as she explains the different areas of the gym and you kind of need to follow her through her explanation. What you need to do is identify where the swimming pool is, where the training rooms are, where the tennis courts are, and where the shop is. So next to the numbers, you're going to be writing a single letter. So for example, number 17, the swimming pool, is that A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. Where's the swimming pool? Now, just as a little tip before the audio begins, you'll be starting at the entrance. And this is typical to all map completion questions. They'll always tell you from where you'll need to begin. Before the audio begins, I'll give you a little bit of time to familiarize yourself with this map. Now, from time to time, you will be stationed at the reception desk here on the bottom floor of the building, just opposite the entrance. This is where you'll greet our visitors and deal with any inquiries before taking them on a tour. You'll need to take them on a full circuit of the building, including all three floors, and I'll explain this to you now. So, from the reception desk, stop at the bottom of the first flight of stairs and show the visitors the swimming pool. You might want to mention that it is heated and opens at 6am daily. Once you make your way to level 2 via the stairs, point out the sauna and steam rooms. These are a great selling point as many people enjoy using them after their workouts. After climbing the next flight of stairs, take the visitors into the weights area, which is a separate room just at the top of the stairs. Many people who are into bodybuilding often want to take a good look inside. As you walk out of the weights room and across the top floor, you'll see all of our training rooms for pump, spin, boxing, yoga and so on. It's quite a large space. Visitors may want to meet and have a quick chat to the trainers, so please be prepared for that. Once you've taken the visitors through the training rooms, take them to the walkway that joins to a separate building and our squash courts, which, as I mentioned earlier, are still under construction. So, for the time being, please don't take them across the walkway. The tour should then take the visitors down the lift, where you can stop on the second floor to show the visitors the tennis courts, if they're interested. Or you can continue to the ground floor, where the elevators open, revealing the store, where we sell our merchandise and health food products. While you're there, don't forget to point out the change rooms which are next door. And then you can return to the reception to get their details and hopefully sign them up. 
Okay, terrific. I think we all have a good idea of the building and where everything is. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, how did you go with this one? As you can see, or as you can hear, the test is getting a little bit harder. It gets harder and harder. And these map completion questions can be pretty tricky. If you want extra practice, or if you want to find out really how to do them, check out the methods lesson on E2 test prep, which is available in a range of packages. Okay, so we're listening for where the swimming pool is. And because you started at the entrance, and then the woman says, stop at the bottom of the first flight of stairs and show the visitors the swimming pool. So the answer must be E, 17 E. We're now listening for where the training rooms are. And the woman says, as you walk out of the weights room, which is A, and across the top floor, you'll see all of our training rooms for pump, spin, boxing, yoga, and so on. It's quite a large space. So the answer for number 18 is B. Okay, so we're now listening for where the tennis courts are. And she says the tour should then take the visitors down the lift where you can stop on the second floor to show the visitors the tennis courts. So really here, we're listening for the lift. And we know that we're on the second floor near the lift. So the answer for 19 is D. That's where the tennis courts are. We're now listening for where the shop is. And the woman says, continue to the ground floor or the first floor where the elevators open revealing the store, which is a synonym for the word shop, where we sell our merchandise and health food products. So we know that we're in front of the lift on the first floor. The answer for number 20 is F. Okay, how did you go with that one? It's a pretty tricky one. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the comments below. Let's look at the next set of questions. Okay, we're now up to listening part three. You're gonna hear different speakers and they're gonna be speaking about a different topic. We're up to questions 21 to 26 and these are sentence completion questions. So sentence completion questions are pretty straightforward. You're going to be listening very carefully and you're going to be completing the sentence with a word or two words and or a number that the speaker says. Importantly, you're not going to change the word in any way. The word is going to come directly from what the speaker says into the gap. Now make sure that you read the instruction again carefully. It says write no more than two words and or a number. On test day, and on the question booklet that hopefully you've downloaded, you might want to underline keywords in the question so that you know where you're up to. Remember that the question order and the audio follow the same order or same sequence. Before the audio begins, I'm going to give you some time to familiarize yourself with each of these questions. So Ben, you want some help with your presentation, right? Yes, I'd really appreciate your help, May. Thanks so much. I'm going to talk about Van Gogh, the artist. Great, he's certainly famous. So you'll speak about his most famous works? I sure will. There are so many though. Most of them are clustered around the end of the 1880s. For example, I really like the Potato Eaters. That one was from 1888. All right, what was significant about that one? Well, at that time, he was still using a dark palette. He used lots of somber, earthy tones and lots of dark brown. I think it was his earliest major piece. A group of people are sitting around a table in a dark room, and there is a single light source above the table. It really harks back to the work of the early Dutch masters. It has a kind of intimacy about it. And another one? I've always liked Van Gogh's chair and bedroom in Arles. They were both from the same year, 1889. In fact, this was a series when he started using brighter colours, which was pretty common at the time. But it was also during this time that his work began to show some unique influences, such as the thick brushstrokes that are so characteristic of his paintings. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? I hadn't noticed. Yeah, there was a whole series like this painted when he was living at the Yellow House in Arles, in France. 
They say he rented the house and had grand plans for it. He wanted to set up an artist's colony. Gauguin lived there for a year or so. You know Gauguin, right? He spent a few years working in Tahiti. Ah, yes. I learned about him in school. Did you know that he was basically unknown until after his death? He was so experimental. I can imagine why people didn't like his work at the time, but I like his work a lot. I love the way he plays with colors. But back to Van Gogh. He painted sunflowers during that period living in Arles, didn't he? Yes, that's right. That's one of his most famous works. Another is Starry Night. It's a little bit later. It's from 1889. And honestly, it's my favorite. While most people like the bright blue and yellow colors and swirls, I'm actually a fan of the texture of the paint. It almost looks like a night sky. Is that painting from when he was living in an asylum? Yes, right. That was from the period after his mental health deteriorated. Such a sad life in the end. But I guess I should stick to the paintings. His mental health issues were certainly sad, but I think what was particularly sad was that he was undiscovered during his lifetime. Oh, I couldn't agree more. That's the real tragedy. Okay, how did you go with that one? This one can be, again, pretty tricky because you're kind of listening and reading at the same time. Let's go through the answers and I'll explain them. Question 21. The potato eaters, which must be the name of a painting, remind the man of art pieces by the what? Now, if we listen very carefully, he says it really harks back to the work of the early Dutch masters. Remember that we can only use two words, so we're going to ignore the word early and we're going to just use the words the Dutch masters or Dutch masters. There are different possible answers here. You could write Dutch masters both with the capital letter at the beginning or Dutch with the capital letter and masters in lowercase. As I recommend, you should write the entire thing in capital letters, which looks like this. All right, question number 22. The man thinks Van Gogh's use of what makes his work distinct. Now, there was a distractor here because he said, in fact, this was a series when he started using brighter colors, which is tempting, but then he says, which was pretty common at the time. That contradicts with makes his work distinct. So brighter colors is actually incorrect. Then he says, during this time that his work began to show some unique influences, which is also a distractor, but that does correspond to making his work distinct. He finally says thick brush strokes. Now, just be careful here because you need the adjective thick. If you just wrote the word brush strokes, it would be considered incorrect. You need that additional information and we can write two words. So thick brush strokes is correct. And also be careful because if you wrote brush stroke, singular, not plural, it would be considered incorrect as well. You must have written brush strokes. Question number 23. Apparently Van Gogh established a what for other artists. Well, there were a few distractors here. It said he was living at the yellow house. That's incorrect. They say he rented the house. That's also incorrect. Finally, it says he wanted to set up or establish an artist's colony. So colony for number 23 is the correct word. Just be careful because if you wrote artist colony or artist colony with different apostrophes or artist colony, it would be wrong. Why? Look very carefully. Can you see that little indefinite article? It's already there, established a. Ah. Therefore, we can't have the word artist because that starts with a vowel. So we're just looking for colony there. Question number 24. The woman mentioned that the Gauguin was what with his use of colors. We're going to need an adjective here. So if we listen very carefully, May says, ah yes, I learned about him in school. Did you know that he was basically unknown? Well, that's a distractor. He wasn't unknown with his use of colors. That doesn't make sense. Then she says he was so experimental. Then at the end there, she says, I love the way he plays with or is experimental with colors. So the answer for 24 is experimental. 
and plays with is a kind of synonym there. Okay, question number 25. The man likes Starry Night, the name of a painting, because of the what of the paint. We're listening here for a noun, the something. Now, there was a very big distractor there. Hopefully, you did not write the word swirls. I'm sure some of you did. That's okay. That's why we're practicing. The answer is, in fact, texture. I'm actually a fan, he says, of the texture of the paint. By the way, I hate to tell you this, if you got that word texture right, but you spelled it incorrectly, you wouldn't get the point, okay? You need to spell the words correctly as well. Okay, question number 26. The students agree it is sad that Van Gogh remained what while alive? We're going to need an adjective here. Now, she says what was particularly sad that's the incorrect answer, that's a distractor, was that he was undiscovered. That's the correct answer for 26. Undiscovered, one word, spelled like this. So your answers should look like this. And remember, you don't need a printer. You can type directly into the downloadable answer sheet. Okay, let's finish up part three with questions 27 to 30. These are matching questions, which can be a bit confusing. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do here is read the question right at the top. It says, what is the key information that should go into each section of the presentation? Now you can see for 27, 28, 29, and 30, it also says section one, section two, section three, section four. So the two students are going to be talking about the structure of their presentation or the plan for the presentation. In other words, in section one, what are they going to talk about? Early life, power of his art, period in France, major works, or mental health. For section two, what are they gonna talk about? A, B, C, D, or E. What you need to write next to 27, 28, 29, and 30 are the letters, or one letter. Before the audio begins, I'll give you a little bit more time to familiarize yourself with this question. Okay, why don't we look at your overall structure now? Yes, all right. I'm going to start at the beginning with his birth in March of 1853 and... Let me interrupt you there. I suggest that you start your talk with his most famous paintings. That way, you'll engage your audience right from the outset. Then, as you are talking later, they'll still have some of those famous pieces in their minds. Oh, I see. Okay. And then I'd probably talk about his early experiences as an adult in Arles, in France. You know, his relationship with his brother and with other artists. Yes, that was certainly an interesting part of his life. As I mentioned, he had dreams of a group of painters living and working together and taking inspiration from each other. But that didn't work out. When do you think I should talk about the fact that he didn't become famous or successful during his lifetime? It's so interesting that his fame came posthumously. Isn't it? He certainly had a difficult life, but you might want to put that in after talking about childhood. His birth, his relationship with his parents, his education, and so on. Yes, that's all worth mentioning. There were several artists in his family, and he had five siblings. He spent much of his life at boarding school, and he hated it. That links in nicely with the psychological issues he battled with. Yes, I'm sure people would be intrigued with his mind and his stranger behaviours, but I think I'd rather frame this section a little differently. How so? Well, instead of just talking about his mental health, maybe I could link it in somehow to what shines through in his art. I'd like to finish off by discussing the profundity of his art. Yes, that sounds really moving. I like it. Mm, me too. Thank you so much for your ideas. So, as you can see and hear, this question type is kind of confusing. What I recommend you do is good quality practice questions before test day. You can do that on E2 Test Prep. Click the link in the description below. Go and sign up. Okay, so we're listening for 27, section one. What information is going to go into section one? What's the plan for the presentation? The answer is D. He's going to start by talking about Van Gogh's major works. Now, there was a distractor right at the beginning. 
Ben says, yes, all right, I'm going to start at the beginning with his birth in March of 1853. And then May interrupts him and says, let me interrupt you there. I suggest that you start your talk with his most famous paintings. In other words, major works. So 27D. So what goes into section two then? Well, May says, and then I'd probably talk about his early experiences as an adult in Arles in France. This is C, period in France. Maybe you got distracted here and wrote A, early life, but it's not early life, it's early experiences as an adult. Can you see how that's different? 29, section three is A, early life. May says he certainly had a difficult life. Hopefully you weren't distracted by that. Then she says, but you might wanna put that in after talking about childhood, his birth, his relationship with his parents, his education, and so on. So that's all of the stuff related to his early life. 29A. And section four, how are they going to finish off the plan for the presentation? Well, the answer here is B, power of his art. And there was a good distractor there. It kind of led you to believe that he was going to talk about his mental health, but then he changes his mind. He says, I'm sure people would be intrigued with his mind and his strange behaviors. And then later on, he also says something about mental health. But then he says, I'd like to finish off by discussing the profundity or the power of his art. Okay, so into your answer sheet, you should have written this. If you're finding this mock test tricky or you just want extra practice before test day, then go to E2 Test Prep. E2 will help you pass your IELTS first time or give you the help you need with one or two sections. You'll find practice questions written by ex-examiners based on real test questions and methods video lessons that give you everything you need to know for high IELTS scores. You can sign up and join the 1.5 million other E2 students who got the scores they needed. Okay, we're now up to part four. This is where it starts to get pretty challenging. And on test day, this is where you start to get a little bit fatigued. So you really do need to concentrate. Come on, let's do it. Let's do questions 31 to 33. This is multiple choice, but it's a bit different to the ones that we've seen previously. So with these multiple choice questions, we're just selecting a single answer. Choose A, B, or C. Before the audio begins, I'll give you some time to familiarize yourself with these questions. Hi everybody, my name's Tim Friday and I'm a medical entomologist. It's great to be back on campus here at Brisbane University to deliver another public health lecture. Today, I'm going to talk to you about mosquito bites. Not just about how much of a nuisance they are, but how they can make us sick if we're not careful. And I'm sure the mosquitoes will be loving the wet weather the entire east coast of Australia has had recently. Mosquitoes naturally increase their population in spring especially when there's lots of water lying around for them to complete their breeding cycles. It's an opportune time to give your backyard a once over and turn over any container that has been collecting water. Mosquito larvae are commonly found in bird baths, uncovered rainwater tanks, pot plant sources, and even brand new roof guttering if it's not installed correctly. Of course, neglected swimming pools can become a prolific breeding ground for mosquitoes too not to mention natural receptacles like tree holes, puddles, and nearby ponds. So what types of mosquitoes are found in Australia? The answer to that question is a lot. The most common mosquito is a silent, spotty little thing called a Mansonia uniformis. It's very likely that every Australian has been bitten by this mosquito at some point in their lives. Another very common backyard mosquito is a white striped mosquito called the Culex australicus. It's typically found in the northern subtropical and tropical parts of Australia. There are actually hundreds of varieties of mosquitoes found right across Australia and, of course, thousands across the world. About 3,500 to be precise. 
but there are only a handful that exist in Australian backyards. Despite the small numbers, these mosquitoes pose a major issue for the nation's public health. As we all know, mosquitoes need blood to survive, and when they bite, it's possible that they spread pathogens that can make us sick. The problem isn't the bite, you see. The problem is that the mosquito may have bitten something or someone else prior to biting you, and then spread any blood-borne disease. Dengue is by far the most common mosquito-borne disease globally. The mosquito that spreads it is called the Aedes aegypti. As this mosquito is not widespread in Australia, the risks are limited to the northeast of the country, and transmission only occurs when these viruses are introduced by an infected traveller. Ross River and the Barmer Forest viruses, on the other hand, are responsible for most mosquito disease-borne infections. More than 10,000 cases are reported each year across the country, with Barmer Forest making up a slightly greater percentage, although outbreaks of Ross River virus have become increasingly common in metropolitan areas, which is a real concern. How did you go? Again, it's kind of difficult to listen and read at the same time. You'll notice that your mind can't do both at the same time. You sort of have to quickly read and then listen, quickly read, listen, quickly read, listen. Move through the questions like this. So, 31, mosquitoes can multiply in uncared for. That's the critical part of this question prompt, uncared for. Is it roof gutters, swimming pools, or rainwater tanks? Now, the speaker says mosquito larvae are commonly found in bird baths, uncovered rainwater tanks. That's not uncared for, just uncovered. And then he says brand new roof guttering. That's not uncared for. And finally, he says neglected swimming pools can become a prolific breeding ground for mosquitoes. In other words, mosquitoes can multiply in uncared for swimming pools. Can you see the synonymous language there? The language that means the same thing, but is said in slightly different ways. Question 32, how many varieties of mosquito are found in and around Australian homes? That's the critical part of this question. Because the speaker says there are actually hundreds of varieties of mosquitoes found right across Australia, that's wrong. And of course, thousands across the world, three and a half thousand to be precise, that's wrong, they're both distractors. Then he says, but there are only a handful, can you see that? C, a few, a handful, that exist in Australian backyards. Despite the small numbers, these mosquitoes, blah, blah, blah. The answer there is C. Number 33, which is the most common mosquito-related disease in Australia? Dengue? Ross River or Barmer Forest. Right at the start, there's quite a lot of information about dengue, but it's not talking about Australia. It mentions Australia, but it's not saying it's the most common mosquito-related disease in Australia. Then, later on, Ross River and Barmer Forest are mentioned together. Finally, the speaker says more than 10,000 cases are reported each year across the country, with Barmer Forest making up a slightly greater percentage. So which is the most common mosquito-related disease in Australia? C, Balm Forest. Finally, there was another distractor about Ross River at the end. You can see that in multiple choice, especially towards the end of the test there in parts three and four, you really need to have the question understood. You need to understand the question. When you're listening, you're really listening for the answer to that question. Don't be distracted. What is the answer to the specific question that was asked? On the answer sheet, you should write this. Okay, we're up to the last set of questions here. Questions 34 to 40, and we're going to complete a flowchart. All right, so we're looking at the life cycle of a mosquito. Let's look at the numbers here because that's the order of the audio and the order of the questions. So you can see 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. So we're going to be moving down and across. Now importantly, the instruction says that we can write no more than two words and or a number for each answer, okay? So we can write one word, 
two words, one word and a number, or two words and a number, or just a number. Before the audio begins, I'll give you some time to familiarize yourself with the life cycle of a mosquito and what you're going to hear. Pay attention to the key words here. Now, I'd like to turn your attention to the mosquito life cycle. Have you ever wondered what the life of a mosquito is like? Well, a mosquito basically goes through four individual stages. It first lives as an egg, then a larva, then a pupa, and finally as an adult. As I mentioned, female mosquitoes look for stagnant water or even damp soil that will soon be soggy with water in which to lay their eggs. For some mosquito species, the eggs float on the surface of stagnant water and stick together to form a sort of raft. Each mosquito egg raft can contain up to 200 individual eggs. Other species simply lay single eggs. Some eggs are left all winter before hatching. However, most mosquito eggs hatch within 48 hours. Mosquito eggs eventually hatch into mosquito larvae. These larvae live in the same water where the eggs were laid and come to the surface to breathe. Some species of mosquito larvae are equipped with siphon tubes for breathing, while others attach to plants to get necessary air. This is quite an extraordinary feat for an insect that is barely mobile. Microorganisms in the water become the mosquito larva's main form of sustenance. While the larvae eat and live, they shed their skins four times to grow larger, and after the fourth molt, the larva becomes a pupa. During the pupal stage, mosquito pupa stop eating and no longer molt. However, they do still move and respond to changes in the light during this resting stage of development. The mosquito pupal stage is very similar to when a caterpillar is in a cocoon during its transformation into a butterfly. Inside the pupa, a fully grown mosquito is developing. Most mosquito species only stay in the pupal stage for about two days during the warmth of the summer. At the end of this metamorphosis, the skin of the pupa splits to allow an adult mosquito to emerge. After the new adult mosquito emerges, it takes some time to rest on the surface of the water. This gives it time to dry and allows its new body parts to harden. This is a necessary step because in order for the mosquito to be able to fly, it has to allow its wings to fully spread out and dry. New adult mosquitoes begin feeding on blood and mating just a couple of days after they emerge. Then they lay eggs and the life cycle begins again. All right, let's look at the answers now. This was, of course, the hardest set of questions. All right, so question 34. Females search for still water or something to lay eggs. Well, it says female mosquitoes look for stagnant water, still water, or even damp soil. That is the correct answer there. And you need the adjective damp. Damp, soil, two words is correct. Question number 35, most eggs hatch inside. Now, I bet you were listening for a location, but remember that prepositions can also talk about time, so inside time, inside two hours, for example. The answer here is 48 hours. It says, most mosquito eggs hatch within 48 hours. And here, we needed a number and a word. And the synonym was actually a preposition within and inside, mean the same thing. All right, question number 36. Some larvae siphon oxygen while others attach to what? We're going to need a noun, and we're probably going to need a plural noun. If we listen carefully to the audio, it says some species of mosquito larvae are equipped with siphon tubes for breathing, while others attach to plants to get necessary air. You can see the synonyms air and oxygen. You can also see the keyword siphon and siphon tubes. So the answer to 36 is plants, plural with an S on the end. Number 37, main form of nourishment are what? We're going to need a plural noun again. And if we listen carefully, it said microorganisms in the water become the mosquito larva's main form of sustenance. 
Sustenance and nourishment are synonyms here. So the answer for 37 is microorganisms. Now, possible answers may include microorganisms, one word, or microorganisms with a hyphen, or microspace organisms, two words, would also be accepted. Again, I recommend writing your answers in capital letters. Now, we're listening for the pupil stage, and this stage only had one question, question 38. It said, during development, they move and react to something alterations, okay? We're kind of listening for an adjective form here. So, the speaker said, they do still move and respond to changes in the light. Changes in the light, light alterations. The answer for 38 is light. Here we go, the last two questions were in the adult stage of the flowchart. 39 said, something dries and strengthens. We're going to need a noun. And if you listen carefully, it said, this gives it time to dry and allows its new body parts to harden. Now, the answer could not be body parts because then it would say body parts dries and strengthens. So we can't use the word parts here but we can use the word body. So one answer option that is correct would be body dries and strengthens, or you could have written new body dries and strengthens. Both would be considered correct. All right, let's do the final question now. Question 40, something eventually unfurl. We need a plural noun for number 40. And what unfurls? Well, in order for the mosquito to be able to fly, it has to allow its wings to fully spread out and dry. So spread out and unfurl as synonyms. The answer to number 40 is wings. So your answers for questions 34 to 40 should look like this on the answer sheet. Okay, so here are all the answers to the listening section. Pay careful attention to questions nine to 16 because you could have written, for example, in number nine, D or E, and then in number 10, D or E. In either order, it doesn't matter. Pay attention also to question 37. You could have written microorganisms as one word or two words or with a hyphen. And number 39, you could have written the word body or new body, both would be considered correct. And finally, Pay careful attention to plural nouns. So for number three, it's three as a number and then years with an S. And number 21, Dutch masters with an S. Number 22, thick brush strokes with an S. And number 40, wings with an S. Well done, you've just done a proper full IELTS listening test. How did it feel? Was it hard? Let us know in the comments below. Let's now calculate your listening score. Okay, so what is your raw score out of 40? And what is your estimated IELTS band score? Let us know in the comments below how you went. Okay, so my final big tip for listening is this, prepare properly. As we saw, some of those question types look pretty confusing and you don't wanna be confused on test day. On test day, your job is to listen very, very carefully and not daydream. So if you wanna find out what those questions look like, how to do them, check out E2 Test Prep. By the way, if you wanna save this video, you can click the little save button and come back to it later to do the reading section, which we're doing next. All right, IELTS reading. Okay, you're now up to the reading section of the test, fantastic. This will take well over an hour, so make sure you have a drink with you. I want you to treat it like the real test. Before we get started, I wanna explain how the scoring works because it's gonna be different for academic and general candidates. Okay, so here are the raw scores out of 40. And you'll notice that there are two columns, one for general and one for academic. So if you're an IELTS general student and you score 30 out of 40, that's the equivalent of an IELTS 7.5. If you're an IELTS academic student and you score 30 out of 40, well, that's the equivalent score of a seven. 
So it's gonna be a little bit harder for academic candidates. Okay, let me give you a quick overview of IELTS reading, just so you know what to expect. So IELTS reading has three sections. There'll be 40 questions in total, and there'll be various question types, and you'll have 60 minutes to complete it. We're gonna do this reading test section by section. There are three sections in total, and each section will have about 13 questions with two or three different question types. I'm gonna explain how the question type works with an example, and then it will be your turn, okay? We'll stop after each section, and I'll show you the answers and explain them to you. We're going to time you, but feel free to pause the video if you need more time, or you can skip ahead if you want. Okay, IELTS reading, section one, it's on Inuit clothing. Questions one to five are on match headings. Let's do a quick example question, just so you know how this works. So how match headings works is like this. You're going to see five paragraphs of text. You'll notice that the paragraph has a letter next to it. So this one has the letter A. Then what you'll see is a list of headings, functional form, humidity control, decorative techniques, etc. What you need to do is read the paragraph very carefully and then select the best heading that would summarize the paragraph in the best possible way. So with this example question here, this paragraph is all about gender expression. You can see tailored in distinct styles for men and women or the shape of the frontal apron flap for the woman's jacket, blah, blah, blah. Some clothing worn by males included design elements generally reserved for women, reflected in their clothing through the use of both male and female design elements. So again, this is gender expression. So I would write IX or nine onto my answer sheet for question one. Okay, are you ready? Do your best, and remember that if it looks a bit small on your phone, you can either download the fillable test book from the description below, which I think is a great idea, or move to a computer or a laptop. Okay, let's do questions one to five. So you're going to see five paragraphs.
Okay, well done, you've just done match headings. Remember to put your answers into the answer sheet as we're going. Let's now do questions six to 10. These are going to be sentence completion questions. All right, so let's do an example question here. And we can only use no more than one word. In other words, we can only use one word taken directly from the passage, not changed in any way to fill that gap and to complete the sentence. So number six says, something was symbolized in the front of the female's jacket by an apron flap. So we can see the keyword there, apron flap, and we can see the answer, which is childbirth, one word. So that's the answer. And that's how we do this question type. Okay, so it's your turn. Make your way through the paragraphs. I'll guide you by indicating which questions relate to which paragraph. It won't be like this on test day, of course, but let's do it.
Okay, how did you go with sentence completion? Hopefully you're feeling confident about your answers. Now remember, click that subscribe button, also hit like. All right, let's do questions 13 to 16, true, false, not given. Okay, let me show you how these questions work because they can be quite tricky. You may wanna watch the methods lesson on E2 test prep, which goes into much more detail, but let's have a look. All right, what we need to do is read the statement. So number 13 says, clothing gender expression was always distinctly male or female. What we need to determine is that true, false or not given. It will be true if the statement agrees with information from the paragraph. It will be false if the statement contradicts information in the paragraph and it will be not given if there's no information on this statement. Now, if we look into the paragraph here, it says, in some cases, the gender identity of the shaman would be unknown, which was reflected in their clothing through the use of both male and female design elements. This contradicts the statement of 13. Therefore, we're going to write the word false. Again, this is pretty tricky stuff. If you get stuck, make sure you go across to E2 test prep and watch the methods lesson and join the live classes. Okay, I'm gonna help you a little bit here. There's no answers in paragraph A and there's no answers in paragraph B. So we're gonna start by looking at paragraph C and you're going to answer question 13.
All right, so we finished section one. How did you go? Did you feel confident? Are you a little bit concerned? Let's take a look at the answers for match headings. All right, questions one to five, match headings. All right, so let's look at paragraph A and we need to determine the heading. Now, there were lots of indications as to what the heading is. It says stuff like areas are some of the coldest in the world to live. Clothing was designed to guard against the freezing cold in several ways. Material to maintain warmth, trap warmth, retain heat, prevent the rising warm air from escaping, prevent heat loss, shield the face from high velocity freezing winds. The answer for paragraph A is eight, V-I-I-I, -I -I, insulation and heat conservation. That is the best heading for this paragraph. Okay, so we can cross off heading eight now. We can't use that again, so that's good. Let's look at paragraph B. It had key words and key phrases like perspire, accumulation of moisture, fresh air to circulate, removing air saturated with perspiration, keeping the Inuit's bodies and garments dry. Outer layer were also quite porous, allowing some moisture to evaporate. The moisture of the Inuit's breath, Animal skins are superior to non-porous materials, allowing moisture to escape. Do not absorb moisture. The answer for paragraph B is two, or II, humidity control. This is all about humidity control. None of the other headings matched this paragraph. So we can now cross this heading off our list. And we're up to paragraph C. The key words and phrases are impervious to the wet. In fact, just that one alone could be enough to give you the answer, but let's keep going. Rain, sheds water, weatherproof, raincoats, wet weather gear, prone to leaking, keep dry. All of these answers point to waterproofing, which is answer number four. So C is four or IV. Paragraph D is all about functional form, or number one, or I. Perform their work without encumbrance. And in fact, the rest of the paragraph was all about functionality. So when we cross that one off our list, we're left with four possible answers for paragraph E. If we look at the key words and key phrases, it says critical to create clothes that would survive day-to-day -day wear and tear. Inuit clothing was not easily replaceable. Minimize stress to the skins. Different cuts of animal skin were used according to their individual sturdiness. Hardier skin, indestructible, clothing tore. All of these words and phrases point to durability. Answer number five, or V. It's critical that you write the answers correctly on your answer sheet. If you get the questions correct, but you write the wrong word or thing on the answer sheet, it'll be marked as wrong. Here's how it should look. So the answer to number one should be V-I-I-I, -I -I, or Roman numeral number eight. Number two should be I-I, -I, or Roman numeral two. Number three should be IV or Roman numeral four. Number four should be I or Roman numeral one. And number five should be V or Roman numeral five. How are you going so far? Remember, you can save this video to watch later by clicking the plus save button. And while you're there, hit the like and subscribe button as well and feel free to share this with your friends. Let's keep going. Okay, let's look at the answers for questions six to 10, the sentence completion questions. So we can only write a single word as the answer, that's it. Number six said, because caribou hair, that's a great key word to use. And if we look into the paragraph, we can see the key phrase caribou fur. So we need to read in this particular section. So caribou hair is what? It retains heat and keeps warmer for longer. Well, if we look carefully, it says caribou hair is hollow. So the answer for number six is hollow. Number seven, the design of the Inuit garments was typically what? So that rising heat would not easily disperse. Well, this particular sentence in paragraph A is key. 
it says garments were also generally bell-shaped to prevent the rising warm air from escaping. The answer here is bell-shaped. Now, this word, bell-shaped, is actually two words joined together with a hyphen. That counts as a single word or one word, so keep that in mind. Question number eight, animal skins. So we're looking in paragraph B here, because this is all about animal skins. It says animal skins are effective at managing sweat via airflow because they are what? So we're looking for a description of animal skins. We also have keywords there, sweat and airflow, pointing to paragraph B. And if you look carefully, animal skins are porous. P-O-R-O-U-S. Okay, question number nine. We're still talking about animal skins here, so we're still in paragraph B. The question says, unlike woven materials, animal skins provide the wearer with more what? Because they don't become stiff. The final sentence of paragraph B says, animal skins also allow for greater flexibility in freezing conditions because unlike woven materials, they don't absorb moisture and freeze to the wearer's body. So the answer for number nine is flexibility. Now, question 10 should have been pretty easy because there's a key word there, warus, that is never mentioned in any other paragraph. It's only in paragraph C. Question 10 says, traditionally, warus what were used to make wet weather clothing? And if we look carefully at this particular sentence, it says, before artificial weatherproof fabrics became available, the intestines or intestines of waruses were used to make raincoats and other wet weather gear. So the answer for number 10 is intestines. For question number 11, we're looking at paragraph D. Men's coats had loose fitting what areas so they could hunt more easily. This particular sentence says, a man's coat, which was meant to be worn while hunting, would provide additional shoulder room for unrestricted movement. So men's coats had loose fitting shoulder areas so they could hunt more easily. What you'll begin to notice here is the use of synonyms. The words used in the question and the words used in the paragraph are different, but they have the same meaning. This is synonymous language, and this is what IELTS reading is all about. There's a video on the E2 test prep platform that talks all about synonymous language. I would check that out if I were you. Okay, so we're still in paragraph D for number 12. The question says to carry babies, women's clothing sometimes incorporated are what? We need a noun. And if we look at this sentence, it says for women, some of their garments included a pouch for carrying infants. You can see the synonyms there, babies and infants. The answer though is pouch, incorporated a pouch. So on your answer sheet for number six, you should have written hollow, seven bell-shaped with a hyphen, eight porous, nine flexibility, 10 intestines, 11 shoulder and 12 pouch. Now you must spell these words correctly or they'll be considered wrong. Okay, let's go through these final answer explanations for true, false, not given. These were questions 13 to 16. So there were no answers in paragraph A. There were no answers in paragraph B. Okay, so we can find the answer for question 13 in paragraph C. Statement 13 says, Nowadays, Inuits use synthetic waterproof materials to make raincoats. The part of the paragraph that we need to read says, before artificial weatherproof fabrics became available, the intestines of waruses were used to make raincoats and other wet weather gear. In other words, nowadays, Inuits use synthetic waterproof materials to make raincoats. There's a bit of an inference here, but the inference is clear. If the inference is clear, you choose true. If the inference is unclear, if there's not enough information, you must choose not given. Okay, question 14 was in paragraph D at the bottom there. The statement says a design constraint 
meant that Inuit hoods were warm but limited wide-angle vision. The final sentence says, hoods were constructed to provide warmth while maximizing peripheral vision. 14 says it limited wide-angle vision. This is a direct contradiction, therefore it's going to be false. The answer to statement or question 15 was in paragraph E right at the top. The statement says, in general, women sewed most of the clothes. In fact, there's just nothing mentioned in paragraph E or any of the paragraphs about women sewing most of the clothes. There's just not enough information given in the paragraph for it to be true or false, therefore it has to be not given. Okay, question 16. Damaged clothes, including tears, would sometimes be fixed while outdoors. Is this true, false, or not given? Well, if we look at the final sentence of paragraph E, it says, if an item of clothing tore, and we can see tears, then it would be fixed as soon as possible, including in the field, if necessary. That means the same thing. The statement and this sentence say the same thing, therefore it's true. On your answer sheet for 13, you should have written true, 14, false, 15, not given, and 16, true. All right, we're now up to section two in IELTS reading. Remember that there are three sections on test day and each section has about 700 to 800 words. So you do need to get good at time management. And that is one thing that we teach you in our live classes with our expert teachers on E2 Test Prep. Click the link in the description below. Okay, so section two is an entirely different passage. It's called Telling the Time Using Water Clocks. So you'll notice a little sentence right at the top that says a water clock is any timepiece by which time is measured by the regulated flow of liquid into, inflow type, or out from, outflow type, a vessel. In this section, we're gonna do match features questions, 17 to 24, and then we're gonna do diagram labeling questions. Let's take a quick look at an example question. All right, so this question type is a little bit tricky. On the left-hand side, you'll see a paragraph with a heading. This one says China, right? And below that, you'll see a list of countries and regions, including Egypt, Babylon, India, Korea, Persia, Greece, and China. Then you're going to see statements. There are three statements here, okay? 17, 18, and 19. What you need to do is read the statement and match it to the particular paragraph or the other way around, read the paragraph and match it to the particular statement. So if we read this paragraph on China, there's a particularly important part. It says the Chinese were one of the first people to develop water clocks that avoided the issue of evaporating water, which gave their clocks more precision. They did this through the sophisticated use of sealants where no water would be exposed to the outside air. Now, 17 says this water clock was used to help farmers determine the best time of day to plant their crops. So that's not about China. And 19 says these water clocks were eventually traded around Central Asia. That's not what this paragraph was about or mentioned in it. Statement 18 says the accuracy of these water clocks was improved because water could not escape into the atmosphere. So that was mentioned in this paragraph Therefore, for number 18, we'll write G, which represents China from the list. If you're a bit confused with this question type, just pause the video and spend some time looking at it until you understand it. Okay, let's get started. You're looking at the paragraph on Egypt and there are eight questions to complete.
Now, this paragraph is a little bit different. It's unrelated to those matching questions. We'll see this paragraph in a minute.
Fantastic, you've just done the match features question. We're now going to return to that paragraph on Korea and we're going to label a diagram. So questions 25 to 31, diagram labeling. I won't give you an example here because it should be pretty straightforward and intuitive. What you need to do is label the diagram from a word or words from the clock parts list. Of course, you need to read the paragraph in order to determine what word goes where. So that's the end of IELTS reading section two. We're two thirds of the way through it, okay? This is great, this is fantastic practice. Let's now go through the answers for section two. Okay, so in fact, for the paragraph on Egypt, there were no answers. In other words, none of those statements related to a Egypt. So we're going to move on. In the paragraph about Babylon, there was a phrase that said, aided astronomical calculations. And if you look at statement 21 or question 21, it says, these water clocks help to measure the movement of celestial objects. In other words, they aided astronomical calculations. So for 21, we would write B. In the paragraph, it also says, their existence comes from writings on clay tablets. And if you look at statement 23 or question 23, it says ancient writing imprinted in clay describes these water clocks existence. So for 23, we would also write B. You need to look closely at the instruction at the top, NB. It says you may use any letter more than once 
And that's why we're able to write B twice. Okay, in the next paragraph on India, there was a part that said similar, the water clocks are similar to the utensil used to perform various religious rituals. And if we look at the statement 17, it says, this water clock resembled a tool used in religious ceremonies. So the answer for 17 is C. So one thing you're probably noticing now is that we're going from the paragraph to the features. We're not going from the features to the paragraph, right? So you read the paragraph on India, for example, you understand it fully, then you read through the features and match the paragraph to the particular feature. Okay, so in the paragraph on Korea, there were two critical parts. The first part said, this innovation no longer required the reliance of human workers. And if we look at feature 22 or statement 22, it says the task of refilling water was automated and human labor made redundant by these water clocks. So no longer required the reliance of human workers, human labor made redundant. So 22, is D, Korea. The last part of the paragraph on Korea said, this water clock was not preserved well and did not survive. However, reconstructions based on text descriptions have been made. If you look at feature 18, it says, this type of water clock has since been recreated according to old texts. That means the same thing as that part of the paragraph. Therefore, for 18, we write D, Korea. We're now up to the paragraph on Persia, and it mentions something about the clock manager. Then at the bottom of the paragraph, it says, he would record the number of times the bowl sank by putting small stones into a jar. If we look at the feature number 20, it says, someone would have to manually keep track of the time using pebbles or small stones with these water clocks. So 20 is E, Persia. In the paragraph on Greece, there were two critical parts relating to different features. The first part says, they also designed one of the world's first alarm clocks. And if you look at the final feature, feature number 24, it says, one such water clock was devised to wake people up. In other words, an alarm clock, therefore 24 is F, Greece. There's another part of the paragraph on Greece that says this type of water clock was used in courts for allocating periods of time to speakers. Feature number 19 says the time allowed to settle a dispute was kept by these water clocks. Therefore, 19 is F, Greece. On your answer sheet, you should have written 17 C, 18 D, 19 F, 20 E, 21, B, 22, D, 23, B, and 24, F. Remember that in IELTS reading on test date, you don't get additional times to fill in your answer sheet. You get 60 minutes total time to complete the questions, and that includes time to transfer your answers onto the answer sheet, okay? Cool, how are you going so far, by the way? Please let me know in the comments below. Okay, questions 25 to 31, diagram labeling. Okay, so the answers are 25 containers. Can you see the containers? And then there is jar, 27 cork prong, 28 floating rod, 29 ball bearing, 30 iron ball, and 31 is bell. So hopefully you've written the same words on your answer sheet in that order. Okay, so before we move on to section three, the final part of the reading test, here is why you should sign up to E2 Test Prep for IELTS preparation. Every day we have live online IELTS classes. Our live classes are taught by expert IELTS teachers, many of whom are ex-IELTS examiners. It's easy to register and easy to join. Join the live online classes today at E2 Test Prep. We're now up to section three of the IELTS reading test. 
how are you feeling now? You're probably getting pretty tired. But on test day, if you've had a big breakfast and a good sleep, you'll be fine. Or even if you haven't, you can do this. Okay, section three. The title of this passage is Battling Cat Allergies with Biotech. We're looking at questions 32 to 36. Yes, no, not given. Okay, let's do an example question together. So this question type is very similar to true, false, not given. The only real difference is true, false, not given deals with facts. Yes, no, not given deals with a speaker's attitude or opinions. Again, what you need to determine is whether the statement says the same thing as the text or reflects the claims of the writer, if the statement contradicts the claims of the writer, or not given if it's impossible to say what the writer thinks about this. So this example question says, keeping house trained cats as pets is a relatively recent development. The passage says, just over a hundred years ago, pet cats live mostly outside the house. The exclusively indoor cat is a modern phenomenon. Therefore, this would be yes, because it says the same thing as the text. It reflects the claims of the writer. All right, your turn. Let's do five of these questions.
How did you go with those true, false, not given questions? Don't worry, we're gonna look at the answers in just a second. Let's now move to the final question type. This is match sentence endings. So these are questions 37 to 40. Here is an example question. So you're presented with half a sentence. Number 37 says, people's allergic reactions to cats. It's really the subject of the sentence. Then in the sentence endings, you're going to see the predicate and you have to match the predicate or the final half of the sentence to number 37, depending on what's written in the paragraph. All of the sentence endings you'll notice will be possible or plausible, but not in terms of meaning. In terms of meaning, there'll only be one that is correct according to the paragraph. So if we read this part of the paragraph, it says, it's only as cats have physically gotten closer to us that their allergenic proteins have become problematic. Or in other words, people's allergic reactions to cats have been intensified by proximity. So if we imagine this to be a complete sentence, 37 with A, it actually says the same thing as that part of the paragraph. So please don't just guess by matching the first half of a sentence with the second half because you can, it has to cohere or say the same thing as the paragraph. Ready? Let's do it. Now, just to help you a little bit, there's nothing mentioned in the first paragraph. So we're gonna to skip to the second paragraph.
All right, fantastic. You've just done a full IELTS reading test. Good stuff, that's amazing. Make sure you click subscribe, click like, and share this video on social media so all your friends can do it too. You might even wanna challenge your friends to see what their scores are. So let's look at the answers for questions 32 to 36, the yes, no, not given questions. So the answer to question 32 is yes. The statement says, manipulating cat genes as a means of dealing with fel d one has shown some limited success. The final sentence of this paragraph says, although the gene therapy is a long way off, it has been proven in a Petri dish. These two statements, or the statement 32, and this sentence in the paragraph say the same thing. They reflect the claims of the writer. Therefore, the answer is yes. Statement 33 says, Yogesh Chandrasekhar set out to eliminate the fal d one protein secreted in cat saliva. This part of the paragraph said he wondered whether he could interrupt that process by feeding the cat something that counteracted the protein in their saliva. Now, there's a big difference here with counteracted and eliminated, or interrupted and eliminated. They're actually kind of contradictory. So I'm going to give you the answer here, which is no. Now we skipped this paragraph, and we skipped this paragraph. Statement 34 says, veterinarians disapprove of cat owners cutting their cat's claws. In this part of the paragraph, it says, we used to declaw cats to save our furniture, which is now frowned upon by veterinarians. You can see here that frowned upon and disapprove mean the same thing. They're synonyms. So in fact, statement 34 and this part of the paragraph mean the same thing. They reflect the claims of the writer. Therefore, the answer is yes. Statement 35 says, Reducing cat fal d one will improve cat-human, human-cat relationships. The final sentence of this paragraph is actually a question. It says, could you make the argument that the less fal d one a cat has, the less the owner and any home visitors will suffer, and so the more the owner, cat, and others will get along harmoniously? This is not given because the writer is not actually making a claim here at all. It's really impossible to know what he or she thinks. Therefore, for 35, we have to write not given. Now for question 36, we need to make an inference. And I don't know if you remember, but in the true false not given questions, I warned you to be careful when making an inference. We can make an inference if it's very clear, if it's just obvious that that's the answer. Let's take a look at 36 though. The statement for 36 says, the effects of reducing fal d one on cat pheromones will harm wild cats. The part of the paragraph that we need to read says, some suggest or scientists suggest that it acts as a pheromone for social signaling, meaning that it may be less important for domesticated housebound pets. It is possible here to make an inference that it will therefore harm wild cats. But this inference is not clear. Be careful. Don't say yes if the inference isn't clear. We're going to have to write not given here because there's just not enough information. It's really impossible to say definitively what the writer thinks about this. 36 is not given. Okay, so on your answer sheet, you should have written 32, yes, 33, no, 34, yes, 35, not given, and 36, not given. So yes, no, not given, and true, false, not given can be pretty tricky, but our live classes on IELTS Reading with our expert teachers will help you out. The link is in the description below. All right, let's look at the answers for questions 37 to 40, match sentence endings. Keep in mind that these questions follow the same order as the paragraphs. 37 said, the amount of the FAL-D1 protein what? 
it varies enormously from cat to cat. That's B. That's because in the paragraph it says, some cats shed more of this protein than other cats, sometimes up to 80 times more, and the amount shed by a single cat will vary from month to month. Again, the amount of the FALD1 protein varies enormously from cat to cat. 38. Breeding cats in a certain way, G, was unsuccessful in eradicating FALD1. At the top of this paragraph, it says, because age-old breeding techniques have failed to eliminate the protein. Question 39. The owner of a cat is exposed to FALD1 via household objects. So it's 39H. And that's because this part of the paragraph says the allergen all over their fur, which in turn gets all over the owner's couch, clothes, bed, and so on. And the final question, question number 40. Injecting FALD1 into hens, A, triggers their immune response. That's because in this part of the paragraph, it says injecting a hen with the FALD1 protein provokes its immune system. It triggers their immune response. So on your answer sheet for 37, you should have written B, 38, G, 39, H, and 40, A. Okay, so here are all of the answers. This is exactly what your answer sheet should look like. And remember, for question seven, it was bell-shaped, which is counted as one word because it's using a hyphen. Also keep in mind that if you accidentally spelled any of these words wrong, it would be considered incorrect. Pause the video and find out what your raw score is. Okay, now let's turn your raw score out of 40 into an IELTS reading score. Remember that if you're taking IELTS general, look in this column. And if you're taking IELTS academic, look in this column. How did you go? Are you happy or are you disappointed? Please let me know your score in the comments below. Now, if you look at the last page on the fillable test book, we have a next step section. It'll tell you how you should prepare depending on the score you receive. Use it. It'll help you to make the right decision about preparation. And keep in mind that E2 has helped over 1.4 million candidates get the scores that they need. If you haven't downloaded the fillable test book yet, please do because we have the writing and speaking sections still coming up. Okay, we're now up to the writing section and I'm going to hand you over to Mark. Mark is an ex-IELTS examiner and he's been teaching IELTS for 10 years. He's gonna take you through writing task two and either academic or general writing task one. I will see you again after the writing section for speaking. Here's Mark with writing. IELTS writing. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm an ex-IELTS examiner and IELTS teacher at E2. I'm gonna guide you through IELTS writing. We're going to start with writing task two, and then you can keep watching for academic task one, or you can skip ahead to general task one. Let's begin with an overview of writing task two. So, for writing task two, you will have 40 minutes to write a discursive essay. You will see a question prompt that will contain one or two statements and one or two questions. You need to understand the statements and answer the questions. You need to write more than 250 words and writing task two is worth two thirds or 66% of your total writing score. Before we begin writing the essay, we're gonna analyze the essay prompt and then plan the essay together. We will then write the essay paragraph by paragraph. I'll give you a basic structure for each paragraph and you will write yours and then I'll show you mine. You should be writing your response directly into the fillable test book and the answer sheet. By the end of this part of the video, you're gonna have written a full writing task two essay with me. You will then be able to submit this for feedback from our E2 expert teachers. 
don't worry, I'll show you how to do this once you've finished your essay. Okay, the first thing we need to do on test day is analyze. Imagine it's test day, and you see this writing task 2 prompt in front of you. It says, Nowadays, many people change jobs quite regularly, rather than working in the one company for their entire careers. Why do you think this is happening? How can companies keep their workers? We really need to understand this prompt before we start writing or even start planning. The first step is always an analysis. You need to think about the broad topic, which is work or employment. And you need to think about the specific topic, which is about employee retention. The questions ask you, why do you think this is happening? That is, why do employees keep changing jobs or moving companies? And how can companies keep their workers? Can you see that these questions are asking you to think about this issue, not from the perspective of a worker or employee, but from the perspective of a business owner, manager, or company? That's important to understand. OK, so we've analyzed the prompt and understood it deeply. Let's now plan our essay. When you plan, you have to make sure you cover all parts of the essay prompt and answer all the questions thoroughly. This prompt has two questions. We will write a paragraph for each question, and we will make sure that we never deviate from the topic of employee retention. If you deviate, you will lose points. I'm going to give you some time to plan your essay. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time. Your paragraph 1 needs to answer the question, why do you think this is happening? Write down the main reason why employees change jobs. This will become your paragraph 1. And for the second question, which will become your second paragraph, think of one or two ways that companies can retain their employees. Start planning now. How did you go with your plan? Mine looks like this. I just noted down. Paragraph 1. Why happening? Employees financially stable, free to move. This answers question 1. Paragraph 2. How keep? Meaning and purpose. This answers question 2. Let's now write the essay introduction. Writing a great introduction is really important because it will set the structure for your overall essay. Now, there's a certain way to write your introduction. There's a structure. I'll briefly tell you here, but you really need to check out the video lessons on E2 Test Prep because they go into a lot more detail. They're not here on YouTube. Click the link in the description below. So, we're going to write a three to four sentence introduction. It'll have three parts. In part one, you'll write a broad background statement about the topic. In part two, you'll rewrite the prompt, not the questions, in your own words. Or put another way, you'll paraphrase the prompt statements. In part three, you'll tell the reader what you will do in your essay. Or put another way, say what your paragraph one and paragraph two will cover, your thesis statement. Make sure you handwrite or type your essay into the answer sheet. If you're taking the paper-based test, you want to print this book out and get used to handwriting with a pencil. 
Or if you're taking the computer-delivered IELTS, you can type directly into this PDF on your computer. As I mentioned, you're also going to have the opportunity to submit your essay for feedback at the end. You now have a few minutes to write your introduction. Pause the video if you need more time. I'll leave the structure on the screen. Try your best to follow it. OK? Start writing.
How'd you go? I'm now going to show you my introduction. Please don't copy it. Instead, use it as a reference for the structure and note some of the language I use. But certainly don't submit this one for feedback, as that's not really going to help you. Remember, by the end, you'll have your own essay written in your own English that you can then get feedback on. That will help you. So, my introduction has three parts. In part one, I wrote, workers are no longer as committed as they once were to the companies that employ them. In part two, I wrote, while people in our grandparents' generation would often work for a company for decades or even their entire lives, nowadays, people tend to change their workplaces every two or three years. And in part three, I wrote, in this essay, I will explain why this is the case and suggest two ways that companies can retain their staff for longer. My introduction has a broad background statement, the paraphrased question prompt, and then my thesis statement. This really is a perfect introduction. On the E2 Test Prep website, we have a whole video dedicated to how to write perfect introductions. You might want to check it out. Here is my introduction without the spaces. Pause the video and look for those three structural parts. Can you see them? So, remember to use the three-part essay introduction structure. It works for any prompt and the question or questions you will get on test day. Okay, now let's write our body paragraph one. Body paragraphs are the most important parts of your essay. They contain the most important information. The IELTS examiners will be looking very closely at them. If you don't know how to write body paragraphs, then check out the methods lessons on E2. In short, your body paragraph needs to have four to six sentences with four main parts. In part one, you will write a topic or opening sentence. In part two, you will elaborate and give reasons. In part three, you should give an example or two to support your ideas. And in part four, you need to conclude your paragraph. I'm going to leave that structure on the screen for you as you write into your fillable test book answer sheet. I'll time you. You can pause the video if you want, but please understand that on test day, you should spend no more than 40 minutes on this essay. You can do it.
How'd you go with your paragraph one? Let me show you mine. And again, please don't copy any of this word for word into your essay. This is just to show you what one good response could look like. There are many ways to write a great paragraph. So, in paragraph one, I answered the first question like this. In part one, I wrote the topic and opening sentence. The main reason people change their jobs more rapidly these days is because they can afford to do so. Then I elaborated, I gave reasons. Because most societies have become wealthier, workers are no longer tethered to a particular company or position financially. In the third part, I gave an example. If a worker wants to leave because of a lack of interest in the work or an unfulfilled ambition, even if it is risky, they are at greater liberty to do so. Finally, I conclude the paragraph. Put simply, stronger economies allow workers to be more selective with their job choices and less dedicated to particular companies. My final paragraph one looks like this. Pause the video and identify the underlying paragraph structure I showed you. Now, please be careful. A lot of teachers, including lots of teachers here on YouTube, tell you to memorize essay responses. This is dangerous. Take a look at this official writing task two answer sheet. Look down at the bottom. This is where the examiners score you. Notice that there are three ways to get a major penalty. The first is by writing off topic. The second is a memorized response. And the third is by having illegible handwriting or handwriting that is too messy to read. Can you see how easy it is to be penalized by the examiners? Some advice teachers give on YouTube is wrong and damaging. I'd recommend just following E2. We've prepared over 1.5 million candidates for their English tests. Subscribe to this channel and let us lead you to success. Having said all of that, let's write our second body paragraph. We will use the exact same structure as paragraph one. It'll have four parts. Your paragraph two should answer the second question. Ready? I'll time you, but feel free to pause if you need a bit longer.
All right, how did you go? Let me know in the comments below how you're finding this. Feel free to ask any questions down below. Here's my paragraph two. Part one, while companies typically offer greater and greater financial incentives to retain employees, they should instead provide greater meaning and purpose, two key psychological drivers. Part two, even if they are paid less, workers who find their work fulfilling and purposeful are more likely to stay in their jobs than those who find their work dull and aimless. And finally, companies need to shift their thinking and focus to finding meaningful and purposeful tasks for their workers rather than just offering them higher salaries. You may have noticed that I didn't provide an example here, and that's because this paragraph was sufficient without one. While you should always stick to the basic structure, you should always remain flexible on test day and write whatever you feel best answers the questions. And here's the completed paragraph. Can you see the underlying structure? It's the backbone of this paragraph. It's flexible, but solid. All right, now let's write the final part of the essay, the conclusion. Our conclusion will have two or three sentences and two main parts. The first part will summarize our arguments or position, and the second part will give a strong final ending. Okay, let's finish off with a bang and write a very strong conclusion that wraps up your entire essay. Again, I'll leave the structure on the screen for you to use.
All right, let me show you how I concluded my essay. In part one, I summarized my arguments. In this essay, I argued that the shift in company loyalty is largely due to increases in societal and personal wealth. In part two, I conclude strongly. Only when management realize that money is no longer a significant driver of retention and meaning and purpose are, the longer they will be able to keep their staff on board. And here's how my final conclusion paragraph looks. Can you see the underlying two-part structure? It's a powerful way to complete your essay and leaves the examiner with a good feeling about your writing. Let's have a quick look at how the essay looks when it's in one piece. So this essay is over 250 words. It's well-structured. It's on topic. It answers the questions. And it uses accurate and varied language. Right. Now that you have a full essay that you've written, you want to get some expert feedback on it. Check this out. E2 gives the best IELTS writing feedback. The feedback you get is comprehensive and will show you exactly what you need to do to get the score you want. To get feedback, simply click the link for Academic or General Writing Task 2 in the description below, or on your downloadable test book. Log in if you already have an account with E2, or if you don't have an account, simply sign up. It only takes a few seconds. After you've logged in or signed up, you can either type up your task 2 under timed conditions or paste your writing in from your test book answer sheet. You can save it and come back to it if you want, or you can go ahead and submit it to one of our expert teachers for personalized feedback. Finally, simply follow the payment options. Trust me, feedback is an investment. It's worth it. Okay, great work. We're now going to do writing task one. If you're taking IELTS General, skip to this point in the video. If you're taking IELTS Academic, just keep watching. Okay, great work. We're now going to do writing task one. IELTS Academic, writing task one. Are you ready to write an academic task one with me? Let me start by giving you a quick overview. In academic task one, you need to describe data. It could be bar charts, line graphs, tables, pie charts, maps, or processes. You need to write at least 150 words, and you should spend no more than 20 minutes on this task. This task is worth one-third or 33% of your writing score. Before we begin writing, we're first going to analyze and plan our response. We'll do this together. Then I'll coach you through the writing part section by section. Just like in the essay, I'll give you a structure, you'll write your response, and then I'll show you mine. You should be writing your response directly into your answer sheet. By the end, you will have a complete academic writing task one. You will then have the opportunity to submit it for feedback from one of our expert teachers. Imagine it's test day, and you see these pie charts in front of you. Before you write anything, you need to understand what you're looking at in detail. Let's start by reading the prompt. It says, the charts show the percentages of family income spent in different categories in South Korea and Singapore in the years 2000 and 2020. The instruction then says, summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. This instruction is always the same no matter what you see on test day. The better you understand the data, the easier it will be to write and the higher your score will be. Analyzing is critical. Okay, now that you understand what you're looking at, let's plan our response. You need to spend a little bit of time after analyzing, planning what you'll write. You need to make a conscious decision about structure. What will each of your paragraphs contain? Will you talk about Singapore in one paragraph and Korea in the next? 
or 2000 and then 2020? There's no right or wrong answer here, but just make sure you make a conscious decision about structure. We need to spend a minute or two analyzing and planning before we write. Okay, let's now begin writing. And we'll start with the overview. The first thing you'll write on test day is the overview. It's a description of the most notable trends of the data. There are two sentences you need to write. The first sentence of the overview is simply a paraphrase of the prompt. You need to rewrite this sentence in your own words. You don't need to change every single word. You can just rearrange it and replace some words with synonyms. The second sentence is a description of the most notable trends of the data. Pick out two key trends and describe them. But don't use any numbers yet. I'll give you a few minutes to write your overview.
How did you go? Let me show you my overview. My paraphrase of the prompt says, the charts illustrate spending in South Korea and Singapore in five categories in 2000 and 2020. Notice that it uses many of the same words. I've only changed it slightly, but importantly, it still captures the meaning of the original prompt. You should never spend too long on this sentence. It should take you no more than a minute. My second sentence is a broad overview of the key trends without any numerical data. It says, overall, housing grew to become the highest cost in both countries, while healthcare costs increased the most. Here, I've identified the two major trends across both sets of data, the countries and the years. These two sentences provide a broad, but solid overview of the data. A good way to think about your overview is that you're explaining the entire data set to someone in two sentences. Let's now write our first data paragraph. Okay, I want you to write your first paragraph using data. You can either talk about a specific country and compare data between years, or you can talk about a year and compare countries. I'll give you a few minutes to write your paragraph. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time.
How did you go? If you haven't written an academic task one before, you're probably finding this challenging. Be sure to check out the methods lessons on E2. They'll tell you everything you need to know. Here's my data paragraph one. In South Korea in 2000, the most common expenditure was other at 29%. Food, housing, and transport were similar at 24, 21, and 20% respectively. Healthcare was a mere 6%. By 2020, however, a number of changes had occurred. Housing rose noticeably, increasing to 30%, making it the highest expenditure. In contrast, the other category fell substantially, dropping to 7%, less than a quarter of its 2000 value. Healthcare showed the most dramatic change, rising from 6% to 18%, an increase of threefold. Food decreased to 20%, and transport increased to 25%. I've just written about South Korea here, and I've compared some relevant data. Please don't copy what I've written. Maybe you want to go back and rewrite yours, but don't look at mine while you rewrite your own. When you get feedback, you want to get feedback on your writing, not mine. Let's write our second paragraph using data. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to write about the other country, or the other year. Make sure you use data in your paragraph and compare where relevant.
Here's my paragraph. It says, Singapore's housing was consistently the highest expenditure, rising from 34% in 2000 to 40% in 2020. Healthcare costs, similar to those of South Korea's, showed massive growth, rising from 3 to 6%, doubling. Similarly, transport increased from 10% to 20%. Despite being lower expenditures, they showed the most growth. Food and other costs both fell. Notice how I've used relevant data, and I've made relevant comparisons as well. This is a very high-scoring paragraph. Now, on test day, you might write two data paragraphs or three. It totally depends on the data set that you are given. You need to plan accordingly and be flexible. There are no right or wrong answers, just conscious decisions about structure. Here's my complete task one from beginning to end. Pause the video and notice how I've written this. Pay attention to the overall structure, as well as the paragraph structures, as well as the sentence structures. Now that you have a complete task one, you need feedback on it. Here's how you can get it. As I said, E2 gives the best writing feedback. To get feedback, simply click the link for Academic Writing Task 1 in the description below, or on your downloadable test book. Log in if you already have an account with E2, or if you don't have an account, simply sign up. It only takes a few seconds. After you've logged in or signed up, you can either type up your Task 1 under Timed Conditions, or paste your writing in from your test book answer sheet. You can save it and come back to it if you want, or you can go ahead and submit it to one of our expert teachers for personalized feedback. Finally, simply follow the payment options. Trust me, feedback is an investment. It's worth it. Fantastic. Well done. That's a challenging task, and it's one that you need to practice. Skip here to meet Jay for IELTS speaking. My name is Mark, and I'll see you later. IELTS General, writing task one. All right, we're going to write a high-scoring IELTS General task one together, just like we did for the essay. And just like the essay, at the end, you can submit your writing for expert feedback. Let's start with a quick overview of general task one. So, just briefly, on test day, you will need to write a letter. The letter will be formal, semi-formal, or informal, depending on the prompt you receive. You need to write more than 150 words. You should only spend 20 minutes on this task. It'll be critically important that you follow the writing prompt closely, and remember that this task is worth one-third of your overall writing score, or 33%. Before we begin writing, we're going to analyze the prompt and plan the letter together. We will then write the letter paragraph by paragraph. I'll help you with each paragraph. You'll write yours, and then I'll show you my high-scoring paragraph. By the end of this video, you're going to have written a complete letter in this booklet. You will then be able to submit this letter for feedback from our E2 expert teachers. Don't worry, I'll show you how to do this once you've finished your letter. We need to spend a minute or two analyzing and planning before we write. All right, so imagine it's test day, and this is the writing task one prompt that you see in front of you. Let's read it carefully. It says you should spend about 20 minutes on this task. Write at least 150 words. Then we have the all-important prompt. You are moving to a new country to go to university and will need a part-time job. You have a friend who lives in that country. Write a letter to your friend. In your letter, 1. Apologize for not staying in touch. 2. Explain why you're moving to this country. And 3. Ask your friend if he or she can help you find a job. You don't need to write any addresses. So let's get this straight. You're writing to a friend. 
you're moving to a new country to study, your friend lives in this country, and you're going to need a part-time job when you get there. Let's just double-check those three imperative words from the prompt, because they dictate what we need to write. Apologize, explain, ask. So, you're going to have three paragraphs in your letter. The first paragraph will be an apology paragraph. The second paragraph will be an explanation paragraph. You're going to answer the question, why? And the third paragraph will be a request. You'll need to ask for help. Narrowing down the task like this helps you to identify exactly what you need to do. Before we start on our paragraphs, we need to write an opening to our letter. Okay, so normally we want to start a letter making the purpose clear. We might say, I am writing to let you know that I'm moving to your country. But we also need to be flexible sometimes. In this letter, we also have to apologize. So that's probably a little bit more important. So we're going to start with that. To open my letter, I've written, Dear John. But you can write dear or hello or hi because it's informal. And then you can select any name you want. You might even want to use the name of a real friend you have. Then I've written a couple of sentences just to open my letter. I know it's been a long time since we've spoken. I hope all is well with you. Now, I'll give you a little bit of time to write your opening. You can write something similar to mine, but please write it in your own words. And keep in mind, we're not at the apology paragraph yet. Okay, let's write paragraph one together, covering the first dot point. What I want you to do is write a three to five sentence apology to your friend for not keeping in touch. Give a reason why you have not written to him or her in a long time, and maybe how you feel about it. Be creative and use interesting language.
How did you go? Remember that on test day, you need to use your imagination and varied, clear, accurate language. Here's my apology paragraph. It says, Firstly, I'm sorry for not staying in contact over the last few years. The last time we hung out, I felt like we needed some space from each other. Did you feel the same? Anyway, I'm excited to touch base again as I have some very exciting news. There's a few things I want you to notice here. First, I'm just writing my apology here. I'm focusing on the first dot point. I'm not including anything about the explanation or the request. I'm not mixing my paragraphs. Second, take a look at the sentence types. I've got simple, compound, complex, and even a question. You should aim to vary your sentences. One thing you want to do before you start writing is imagine a real scenario. This will help you to write a coherent and believable letter. So perhaps you need to apologize to your friend because you missed his birthday party, or perhaps you didn't drive her to the airport, or maybe something deeper and more emotional. He or she needed a friend, and you weren't there. You might not explicitly say this in your letter, but if you have a realistic backstory in your mind, it'll help with the way you write the letter. It makes it more believable, and your language will be stronger. All right, let's write paragraph two. In paragraph two, you're going to explain why you're moving overseas. Remember that in the prompt, it says you're moving to study, so definitely you want to include that. I won't say any more, but I'll give you some time to write a three to five sentence explanation paragraph.
How did you go? Here's my explanation paragraph. It says, I'm moving to Canada next month to study, and I can't wait. I'm transferring to the University of Toronto so I can specialize in artificial intelligence. As you probably remember, I've always been interested in that topic. So it's an amazing opportunity. Note the compound and complex sentences, and also note the use of collocations, or natural-sounding phrases like can't wait, and specialize in, and interested in, and amazing opportunity. My language use is not over the top. I'm not trying to use sophisticated language because I'm writing to a friend, and that would be unnatural. I'm just using everyday colloquial language that is clear, natural, and makes sense. Okay, let's focus on paragraph three, the request paragraph. I'll give you a few minutes to ask your friend to help you find a job when you arrive in whatever country you're moving to. Remember to add some interesting details, vary your sentence types, and use natural-sounding phrases. Go.
How did you go? Let's take a look at my paragraph. Mine says, but I need your help with something, if you don't mind. While I have plenty of savings, I'm going to need to find a part-time job almost as soon as I arrive. Ideally, I'd like to work for a tech company, but I'm happy to work in hospitality again, if need be. Would you be able to help me out? Notice that I've said, work in hospitality again. This shows that I have a believable backstory and helps with my narrative. In a way, I'm connecting my letter to my personal history with my friend, and it just makes it more authentic and cohesive. Okay, let's finish up the letter using English letter writing conventions. Here, I've written a closing sentence that wraps up my letter, then a sign-off, then my first name. I want you to do the same. I'll give you a little bit of time to complete your letter. Please don't copy mine word for word. Try to use your own ideas. All right, you did it. Well done. You've completed your IELTS general writing task one letter from beginning to end. That's exactly what you need to do on test day. Now, let me show you how you can get feedback on this letter. As I said, E2 gives the best writing feedback. To get feedback, simply click the link for general writing task one in the description below or on your downloadable test book. Log in if you already have an account with E2, or if you don't have an account, simply sign up. It only takes a few seconds. After you've logged in or signed up, you can either type up your task one under timed conditions or paste your writing in from your test book answer sheet. You can save it and come back to it if you want, or you can go ahead and submit it to one of our expert teachers for personalized feedback. Finally, simply follow the payment options. Trust me, feedback is an investment. It's worth it. All right, so now you've finished IELTS writing. Let me now hand you back to Jay, who will take you through IELTS speaking. Remember that you can save this video to watch later if you want, and don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, and hit like. My name is Mark, and I'll see you soon. IELTS speaking. Welcome back. How did you go with writing? I really do recommend that you get some writing feedback. Writing is the most challenging part of the IELTS, and by getting some feedback, you'll really improve your chances of getting the score that you need. Okay, you're doing really well. You've reached the final part of the test, IELTS speaking. I'm gonna be your examiner today, and I'm gonna simulate the speaking test from beginning to end, so you know exactly what's gonna happen on test day. Before we begin though, let me give you a quick overview of IELTS speaking. So IELTS speaking is one-on-one -on -one with the examiner. It's 11 to 14 minutes total. It consists of an identity check, which is unassessed, and then part one, small talk, part two, a two-minute talk, and part three, a discussion. All right, so on test day, you should arrive early for your speaking test. Give yourself plenty of time and don't forget to bring your passport or ID. You'll be asked to wait in a room and then the examiner will come to collect you. You will then follow the examiner to the room for the test. Now, I just wanna to talk to you briefly about nervousness because it can be a big factor for a lot of people. 
First of all, it's completely normal to be nervous leading up to test day and during your speaking test. It's fine, it's really okay. Each time I've taken IELTS speaking, and I've taken it five times, my hands got sweaty and my heart beat quickly. I was nervous and it was fine. Remember that it's just 15 minutes of your life. Take a deep breath, you can do this, okay? Let's start by simulating the identity check. The identity check only lasts for 20 or 30 seconds. It's not assessed. Don't give long answers here. Just give brief, factual answers. Let's do it now. Ready? Hi, my name is Jay. I'll be your speaking examiner. Can you please tell me your full name? What can I call you? Can you tell me where you're from? May I see your identification, please? Okay, we're now up to the assessed part of the speaking test. Part one, small talk. So in this part of the test, I'll ask you 12 questions on three different day-to-day -day topics. It'll go for about four or five minutes. You just need to answer each of my questions in two or three sentences. Ready? Let's talk about where you live. Do you live in a house or an apartment? Who do you live with? What is your favourite room? What would you change about your home? Okay, good. Part one isn't over yet because the examiner will now change topics and ask you some other questions on an everyday topic. But I wanna stop here and show you how I would respond to those first four questions. Here's the first question and here's my response. I live in a one bedroom apartment just near the Botanic Gardens. It's a really cute old art deco apartment with a fireplace, I love it. Here's the second question. And here's my response. I live alone, which I really like. I've lived with housemates before, but I much prefer to live by myself. Here's the third question. And here's my response. Ah, uh, my favorite room would be the lounge room. It's connected to a balcony that looks out over the street and it also has a fireplace. It's really nice in winter lighting the fire. Here's the fourth question. And here's my response. Well, I actually rent the apartment, so I can't change much, but if I could, I would make the kitchen a bit bigger. It's currently a little bit cramped and there isn't much bench space. Did you notice that I gave concise, relevant answers? Try doing the same. And as I mentioned, the examiner will now ask you a few more questions on a different everyday topic. Ready? Let's go on to talk about friends now. Are your friends mostly your age or different ages? Do you usually see your friends during the week or on weekends? The last time you saw your friends, what did you do together? In what ways are your friends important to you?
Okay, well done. Let me now show you how I would respond to those four questions. Here's the first question, and here's my response. Most of my friends are my own age, but I've certainly had lots of friends throughout my life that have been different ages. In fact, two of my best friends were a lot older than me. One was about 70, in fact. He was a great guy. Here's the second question, and here's my response. I play sport during the week, so I see some of my friends then, but I usually see my good friends on the weekends. And actually, some of my best friends, I only see every two or three months. I guess we're all pretty busy these days. Here's the third question, and here's my response. I caught up with some old high school friends on the weekend, actually. It was really fun. Uh, we had dinner and played virtual golf together. Here's the fourth question, and here's my response. Ah, uh, friends are really important to me because you share your life with them. They know you, they know your stories and where you've come from. They can also be honest with you and tell you in which ways you need to improve yourself. I'm a very loyal friend. So as you just saw in my second set of answers, I'm beginning to extend myself a little bit more and I'm using a range of different grammar and sentence structures to express myself. All right, let's do the third set of part one questions. Ready? I'd like to move on to talk about food and cooking. What kind of food do you like to eat? What kind of new food would you like to try? Why? Do you like cooking? What was the last meal you cooked? Okay, well done. Let me now show you how I would respond to those last four questions. Here's the question, and here's my response. Uh, I really like all foods. I don't think there's a type of cuisine that I don't like, to be honest. I guess my favorite food is anything that's healthy. I really like meat and salads and dips, so probably Middle Eastern types of food, especially Lebanese. Here's the second question, and here's my response. Hmm, that's a good question. I don't think there's any food that I haven't tried. In Melbourne, it's possible to get all different types of cuisines from all around the world. I'm very experimental, so I think I've tried them all. Here's the third question, and here's my response. I don't love cooking. I'm not a bad cook. I tend to make food that's quick and simple. I know some people like to put in lots of effort for meals, but the eating part only takes a minute, so I tend to just make simple dishes. Here's the fourth question and the final part one response. Well, last night I ate some leftovers, uh, but usually I just have a piece of fish and some vegetables or something simple like that. I also try not to eat too many carbohydrates. You probably noticed that I didn't explicitly answer some of those questions. For example, one of the questions was about a type of food that I'd like to try, and I told the examiner that there's no food I hadn't tried before. You can deviate slightly, that's fine. All right, IELTS speaking part two, the two minute talk. This part is a bit weird and it's certainly something you need to practice, even if your English is perfect. What's gonna happen is I'm going to give you a task card. You can find this in the downloadable test book. You'll have one minute to prepare and then you'll have two minutes to speak. Ready? 
I'm now going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say. You can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand? Here's some paper and a pen for making notes and here's your topic. I'd like you to describe something you saved money to buy. I'd like you to now speak for two minutes on this topic. You can begin. Okay, how did you go? It's quite tough, right? If you're a bit unsure of how you went or what to do, then I recommend checking out a range of packages on E2 Test Prep. Nearly every E2 IELTS package includes a one-on-one -on -one speaking mock test with one of our expert IELTS teachers. It's very simple to book and take. Simply choose a day and time of your choice and click the Zoom link just before the time of your booking. Importantly, you'll receive lots of valuable feedback so you'll know exactly what to do on test day to get that high score. Get an IELTS test prep package with E2 today. I'll now show you what I would do on test day. As I mentioned, I've taken this test five times and each time I've got a nine. Firstly, here's what my notes look like from the one minute preparation time. All I wrote was Walkman, car and house. Notice that I only wrote three words. On test day, trust me, time goes like this. You can't write much. If any IELTS teacher tells you to write down anything more than just a few words, they obviously have never taken this test themselves. And that's why you should stick with E2. Click that subscribe button. And here is my two minute response. Please pay attention to my vocab, grammar, pronunciation and fluency. 
Okay, so the first thing that I ever really saved money to buy was a Sony Walkman. I'm not sure if you remember what a Walkman is, but it preceded the iPod and iPhone. It was a mobile cassette player. I was about 15 years old. I think it took me about six months to save up for it. And I remember the price, it was $60, which was quite a lot of money for me back then. I also remember the shop that I bought it from. I guess I remember it clearly because it was such a significant event in my life at the time. The reason I wanted to buy it was to listen to music, of course, as I was really into punk rock, but I also wanted to buy it because it was cool. I guess it was a kind of status item. Some of my friends had Walkmans and I thought I needed one as well. I also remember that the batteries constantly needed replacing, but yeah, it was an important purchasing decision in my life and made me feel good about myself. Uh, more recently, I bought a new car. It was by far the most expensive thing I've ever purchased. Well, actually, when I say new, it was just secondhand as it only had about 4,000 kilometers when I bought it, which is pretty much brand new, but it was expensive. I bought it from a Chinese international student who was moving back to China, and I think I got a bit of a bargain. The reason I wanted a new or newish car is because I've always driven old secondhand cars and I didn't want one that would break down. I'm really happy with it, it drives beautifully. And uh, I guess at some point I'm going to need to save up for a house. As you know, house prices here in Melbourne are very expensive. So people usually only save up a deposit and then take out a 30 or 40 year mortgage. I really loathe the idea of debt. So I'd much prefer to pay a big chunk of the house off rather than be stuck with a debilitating mortgage for like the rest of my life. It's just not for me. You may have noticed an underlying structure to my part two. I actually used a very clever strategy that makes doing a two minute talk much easier and allows you to extend your grammar and vocab quite a bit. If you wanna find out more about it, check out the speaking part two methods lesson on E2 test prep. Okay, IELTS speaking part three, the final part, this is the discussion with the examiner. So part three, the discussion will carry on from the topic you received in part two. So because you spoke about saving money, you're now going to have a discussion with the examiner on a range of questions related to money and personal finance for about four or five minutes. This is where you can really extend your answers and show off a great range of relevant vocab and flexible grammar and of course, clear pronunciation. This part of the test is very interactive. You need to listen carefully and respond appropriately to the examiner. It's just like a real life discussion. So I'll ask you a question, you'll respond, and then I'll show you how I would respond to that question. Ready? Do you find it difficult to save money? Here's the question, and here's my response. Ah, uh, I do. I've just reached a point in my life where I get paid a decent salary, so I don't really feel like saving money. I'm enjoying spending it. Admittedly, I spend quite a bit on eating out, and I also like buying clothes online. If I cut back on those expenses, I could probably save quite a bit of money, but I'm not ready to sacrifice just yet. Maybe next year. Okay, next question. Do you think it's easier to save money now or in the past? Here's the question, here's my response. Well, I think the internet has made it much easier to spend money. I mean, online shopping is so incredibly simple to do. Before you know it, you've clicked a few buttons and added something to your cart and bought something. So yes, I think in my parents' generation, there would have been less things to spend money on. Mind you, this generation is wealthier than previous generations, so maybe it's okay that we spend more money? 
Okay, next question. How has technology changed the way people spend money in recent times? Here's the question, here's my response. Well, apart from online shopping, there are all sorts of different ways to spend money. Cryptocurrency comes to mind as one, but also just different payment systems. There are credit cards, of course, uh, but a more recent one that's popular here in Australia is Afterpay, where you buy now, pay later. Of course, you have to be careful of all the hidden fees they charge you. Okay, next question. Should school children be taught to save money? Here's the question, here's my response. Absolutely. I think teaching children the importance of being thrifty or managing personal finance is really important. It should be part of the school curriculum, maybe from about grade six, or perhaps it could be combined with a maths class so students learn mathematics and personal finance at the same time. That'd be a great subject. Okay, next question. Do you think it's easier to save money in the city or the country? Here's the question, here's my response. In the countryside, for sure. There's just not much to spend money on. I mean, walking in the forest or swimming at the beach really doesn't cost anything, whereas doing just about anything in the city costs money. As soon as you step out of the door, you're getting out your wallet, so to speak. So yes, living in the countryside is simply cheaper. All right, next question. What are some ways to manage savings? Here's the question, and here's my response. Well, budgets are helpful, but I can't say I've ever used one. I think there are all sorts of apps that you can download onto your smartphone these days to help with managing your finances as well. I'm sure there are things you can add to your phone to block you from spending money. I think technology can actually be pretty helpful when it comes to saving money. All right, next question. Do you think people who have a higher standard of living also enjoy a better quality of life? Here's the question. Here's my response. Uh, that's a good question. I think so. I mean, money does buy better experiences, certainly when it comes to restaurants or sports cars. But then again, some experiences that cost nothing are often the best, hanging out with friends or seeing your family. So I'd say in general, yes, money does help with a better quality of life, but only really with material objects. So you saw there that I really started to extend my answers and give very thoughtful responses. My language simply described the ideas I was having in response to the examiner's questions. Okay, well done. You've just done an IELTS speaking test and an entire IELTS test. I hope that gave you a good feel for what it's going to be like on test day. 
Unfortunately, on test day, I won't be there to help you. I wish I could join you. So you will need to practice on your own. All right, before we finish up, we have the most important section coming up. Next steps. Okay, well done. That was a huge challenge. You've just done a full IELTS test. If you have any questions, pop them into the comments below. And while you're there, click like, hit subscribe, and share this video with your friends on social media. All right, so throughout this video, I've talked to you about the importance of practice. On the last page of the fillable test book, you will see a little table to fill out with your mock test scores and the scores you need. It'll show you exactly what E2 package you need based on your scores. Preparing with E2 will save you time and money and give you the confidence you need leading up to and on test day. Thanks very much for watching this video. I know it was enormously long, but hopefully it was helpful. Remember to share it with your friends. My name is Jay, and I wish you the best of luck on your IELTS test.